I was asked by the Prime Minister to uh, produce a set of recommendations uh, for implementation of changes in the National Health Service in, of England in response to the, the, um, the Francis Report and its sequelae. Uh, I chose to do that through a committee, uh, working a, a, an advisory group. Uh, we, uh, I nominated and we selected about 15 members, 15 or 16, I can't remember the number exactly, uh, but it was a wonderful group. Everyone asked, agreed. It consisted of scientists, people interested in organizations, organization theory, safety and quality. Um, some managers and clinicians from the NHS, although no one currently in a, in a, a senior executive role within the National Health Service uh, at, the, in, in, uh, at, the, at the center. Uh, and um, most importantly, patients, uh, patient representatives on the group who were enormously valuable. We appointed a series of special advisors who, who we could call on for guidance, but who because, they, because of their current roles would not have been appropriate for membership in the committee. We met virtually mostly uh, about every fortnight for a couple of hours by video. There were seven working groups established and they met in parallel. So we had a lot of the, uh, these people put in a lot of time and I'm very much in their debt. It was an amazing group to lead. We are indebted to Robert Francis. Uh, his report was the, was the initial uh, reason for our being called into, into um, existence. Uh, Robert himself was enormously generous. He was a special advisor to the group and in many occasions when we needed clar clarification or guidance or kind of know, needed to know what went inside his brain, he, he, he generously met with us as did, as did others. I want to say a special word about Bruce Keogh. So Bruce Keogh, you know, produced the Keogh report on 14 high mortality trusts. It came out while we were doing the work that was a completely separate and independent enterprise. To my knowledge, there was no interaction between our group and Bruce. And it is eerie to read Bruce's report because we really did converge. And I think in terms of confidence about the directionality of recommendations, we have two independent findings which, which point in pretty much the same direction. I wanted my hat is off to Bruce for a stunning piece of work. We began uh, by outlining problems. We don't want to stay there. This is about the future, not the past. But we wanted to, s to say what we thought we were seeing uh, as we examined the Mid-Staffordshire story and other stories that emerged during the period of our deliberations. Here are the seven findings that began kind of the problem list for us. The first is that we just don't believe Mid-Staff is an isolated case. Uh, it is a symptomatic case, a notorious case but of some problems in the NHS where there are safety issues. Uh, there are some outliers like Midstaffs that have apparently high mortality rates and Sir Bruce has done a pretty good job beginning to investigate some of those cases. More generally, like any large complex system, their safety and quality is a challenge in the NHS as a whole. So we're, we're dealing not just with Midstaffs, we're dealing with the, with the whole system. The second, we, th there just isn't anybody in the committee that believes that blame is the right approach with, with respect to staff. The, you have 1.4 million people working in the NHS in England. We think they're, in general, just as dedicated as any of you would be to making it a great service, to fulfilling, giving meaning in their own lives, helping relieve suffering, and, and to start from a platform that somehow everything's gone wrong and the staff don't care is just, just not something we, we, we sign on to. We're working with a different theory. Uh, we sense incorrect priorities that, that, could, that did develop. Certainly, if you study the mid-staffs case, there was a diversion of leadership attention toward two things, really. Quantitative targets, a kind of game in a tick-the-box approach, and second, finance and financial diligence. And the more general agenda of making sure the patients get the correct care, the, the, the best possible care, the patient at the center of care, that kind of got lost in the, in the attention to details, that they were dealing with trees, not the forest. And we we scored that as priorities that had gone amiss or had been interpreted to go amiss. Often it was a leader who had articulated something and the staff picked it up as a game when they did, that was not what the leader intended. That things were going wrong could have been known far earlier than it was known in mid-staffs. There were signals both quantitative, for example, in the mortality rate metrics, which were way off scale. This was not a marginal case of you know, fine-tuning a mortality measurement. This had to do with, with three or four standard deviations of unexpected mortality rates. They were known. Uh, and uh, if, that, if, if the quantitative data weren't enough, there were qualitative data. Staff, patients, carers were speaking up about problems, and they were not heeded. There was a, something about what was going on in that setting in which really important information was not being acted on. It was being either explained away or lost entirely. With respect to outside regulators, one of the, one of the phenomenologies we think we observe and uh, that Robert commented on strongly in his report is a is a complexity of the regulatory scheme in NHS England 
uh, a lot of agencies responsible for different components of experience and quality. And if you add in the responsibility for financial stewardship, it even gets more complex. From the field you hear, this is tough to deal with. Lots of metrics coming at us, lots of demands, lots of inspections. And the regulation, instead of becoming a absolutely focused, clear, respectful, simple uh, enterprise, has became far too complex. And it gets very hard to, to, to give care or to manage care under that kind of environment. Um, there was no visible support for what we'll call a system of improvement. We'll deal with that more in a few minutes, but it means a system by which a staff, all staff, clinicians, managers, frontline staff can learn how to improve. They can understand how to improve their own work as part of their work. And B, a social system which allows people to learn from each other both within organizations and among organizations. Midstaffs was not part, so far as I know, of any collaborative improvement effort that would have kept them in a community of shared effort and there was no centralized resource for that. And all, from all of that emerge, emerges uh, an atmosphere of fear. You can almost feel it as you read the Francis Report as people became frightened of the very information that they could have used as a foundation for their improvement. Uh, if you take this list of problems and you can juxtapose solutions, let me show you the general framework we began to work from as we arrived at our more specific recommendations. The first is you have to recognize the problem. All improvement begins with aims. And a general th thought, I think I can speak for the group, is we have to be able to say that things are wrong in order to set them right. And that general idea that transparency and openness about defect is absolutely key, but not in a blaming culture. Certainly there are miscreants, and we'll give, deal with that in a, few, in, in a few minutes, but very, very few. The idea that somehow you can say things are wrong and you're doing it, or you're doing it, or this party did it, or that agency did it, is just not, not mature. It's not an appropriate reaction to the problems of uh, improvement. Reassert the primacy of working with patients and carers. If, if mid-staffs had listened to the patients, listened to the carers, or the staff, if, if someone had said, what are they telling us, put, put it together, they would have been on alert. They would have been worried. They would have begun to have some diagnostic work done. Instead, the voice of the patient, the voice of the carer, the voice of the staff was muted. It was, it was, it was uh, and eventually more or less ignored. Quantitative targets were not ignored. They became part of the game, waiting times, uh, particular benchmarks to hit, and, they, and it was a tick-the-box mentality that was not favorable to the focus on patients. Uh, all of this quelled transparency because as the data become troublesome or, or inscrutable or, or worrisome, as, you're not, as you don't hit your target, as people do speak up and you don't have a way to remedy it, you can't work on improvement, well, you hide. You, 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 you run away from the data, and that's what you observe. In a proper improvement culture, I think our, our advisory group is unanimous, transparency is essential. You have to be able to turn the lights on in order to improve. Um, and with respect to the outside regulatory system, uh, simplicity, clarity, and, 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 and channels of responsibility that are easy to understand are crucial to being able to direct the system in response to outside regulation correctly. If you don't build skills, you don't get skills. And uh, I, I wanted to, I, I, it's been a long day for me, but uh, so to wake myself up, I, I thought I'd play a little game with you. Um, here's a game, okay? I'm gonna say some numbers and you say them back to me. You ever play this game? So if I say three, six, you will say? Three, six. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you some numbers, you repeat them back to me, here they come. Three, three, two, five, three, two, seven. Perfect, almost perfect. Uh, <laughs> are you ready for another one? Six, oh, three, seven, two, six, five, one, two, three, four. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what happened was we just exceeded the capacity of short-term memory. It can store seven items. It can't store, hi, Secretary. Um, so you, you succeed at seven, you fail at nine. Uh, if we design a task that has, in which a worker has to remember seven items, they will likely succeed. If we design a task in which they have to remember nine items, they will almost certainly fail. It, it's a systems view of improvement. Now, how do I know that? I know it because I studied. I've studied safety. I've, I understand how frail short-term memory is as a guide to 
uh, to, to correct work. Well, that means all of us, the, the, the managers, the executives, the workforce, they have to know that. They have to understand the relationship between job design and execution. Blame will help not at all. Design helps, and design depends on knowledge. This is a very small example of what it would be to be an NHS constantly able to use science for proper design and improvement. You get it? We could go on all day long with games like that, but I won't bother you. Um, we speak in the, in, the, um, in the report a lot about pride and joy in work. That's not something that plays well in a lot of crowds. I think it's essential. You've got an enterprise trying to make healthcare a human right. You have the potential to be a system as excellent as any in the world. People should feel wonderful about being able to work in the NHS. They're committing their lives to it at their time, their waking hours, their spirit. And there's no reason why the system can't aspire to, to pride in that service. You saw it at the Olympics. You saw the whole world watching you celebrate uh, you know, a national treasure, and now we're fretting about that treasure. That's not right. It's, uh, it's still the same place that you, uh, you celebrated uh, at the Olympics. Remember it and tell 1.4 million people that's true. Um, nonetheless, uh, the challenges are big. Um, you're going to have to grapple with culture. You always do. This isn't special to the NHS. You're going to have to think about how people behave, what they think, how they deal with each other. The elements of culture are going to matter. We will talk about regulation. We'll talk about rules. We'll talk about measurement. We'll even talk about punishment. But that's not the trick. The trick is to develop a culture. And the culture we're after is a learning culture. And I'm going to try to explain what that looks like. Um, when we're going to use the word quality a lot. I'm just harking back to, uh, to, to Lord Darcy's uh, definition of quality in his report. It's, it's, it's just fine. It's, it, it's a combination of properties of the system. We're after safety, effectiveness, and, and total experience of the patient. I want to point out that although mid-staffs focuses on safety and it gets our us focused on safety, quality is not divisible. And, and by working on safety, you, you must open a door to total excellence and, and keep that in mind. This, this, this report, our work, is not just about safety. It's about excellence overall. So our report's organized on these categories. And I'm going to walk you through the recommendations then dive in a little more deeply. Uh, each of these categories had a working party more or less associated with it. And I, I commend my, my colleagues for the hard work they put in in those working parties. Okay, the overarching goal, this is just the unifying goal for, for the whole system. We are recommending that um, continual and never-ending improvement of the well-being of the patient, in the particular case here, reduction of harm. Uh, the Prime Minister, I think quite dramatically and courageously, set out zero harm, and I'm glad he did. That's a star. That's a guiding star. It's a north star, zero harm. The actual agenda, day to day, is continual reduction of harm. That's the way to think about it. That should be intended, monitored and embraced throughout the system. Um, the reflection in the leadership arena is that this then becomes the job of the leader. If the leader doesn't embrace this in the daily leadership activity, focusing on quality and patient safety, at, at the top of their priorities list, look at that list, investment, inquiry, daily inquiry by the leader, improvement, regular reporting, encouragement, support, don't expect the staff to invest. They're going to follow the signals of the leader no matter how much they care about their work. The third area of recommendation is about patients and carers, and here we are, we're talking about complete empowerment of patients and carers, way beyond tokenism, anything beyond, way beyond occasional representation or focus groups. We're talking about the presence and involvement of patients and carers at all levels in the system at all times. The fourth uh, set of recommendations are around staff. This has turned out to be the lightning rod recommendation in some ways uh, today. Uh, one of them, uh, we, we believe, as any normal caring person would be, there should be sufficient staff now and in the future. And it is a job of the entire system to assure that. The question will arise as to whether we're going to set numerical targets for that, but the answer is no, we're not, not at the moment, and I'll deal with that in a few minutes. Uh, in terms of building staff capacity, I would put this at the top of the list of recommendations. It is to have a service that invests, I think, from the center as well as throughout in the constant improvement of the, of the capabilities of the workforce to invest in their own learning and improvement. And that is at two levels. The individual learning more and more how to improve their own work, and to do that in a collaborative environment in which people can share the results of their improvement efforts. So it all teach, all learn. There's learning going on everywhere, and that's what we call a learning organization. And NHS invested in the processes of learning, not just within, but among organizations. 
An asset in that is transparency. You remember in the Mid-Staffordshire account, transparency was a threat. It, was, it produced fear. If the numbers appeared, I might be in trouble. I would be judged a failure. Something bad will happen to me, or I will feel helpless and can do nothing about it. Well, that's not what we want. But we don't want to get out of fear by avoiding transparency. The, 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 the idea of total commitment to revealing and sharing knowledge about what's going on is a very important uh, recommendation for, for, for our uh, committee. Um, and in that measurement process, the transparency process, knowing what the patients and carers are saying and thinking is crucial. And, and we just can't say enough, strongly enough, the importance of listening to the patient and carer voice as, a, as an essential asset in monitoring the state of the system. What about the hard edge? Not just the, not the learning edge, but the supervision and enforcement edge. Well, we understand the need for regulation. Uh, and in particular, we think that there needs to be an apparatus in the, in the country that looks at performance in the, in the NHS. We think the current apparatus <coughs> is too complex. Uh, we hear that in the Francis Report. We've seen it in our own investigations. There, there's, there's a diffusion of responsibility because too many agencies are responsible for different parts of, of excellence. And if you add in responsibility for financial stewardship, it gets, it gets even, even harder. And so we need something like simplification and clarification of the regulatory regime. With respect to the hard edge of regulation, the enforcement piece, which frankly Robert Francis was strong on, stronger than I think we feel, we recognize the need for some strong regulation, but we're, we, we're taking a hierarchical approach to regulation, which the final level of regulation, the, the introduction of criminal sanctions or serious sanctions is just, it's the port of last call, it's the last place to go. What we need is a tiered system of regulation and oversight, which is much more responsive to actually what's going on on the ground. And maybe other committee members will want to speak up uh, before I'm finished. Let me go a little more deeply into the, um, into the recommendations as outlined. The overarching goal I've st stated to you is that the, the system becomes oriented around continual improvement as its central aim. All leaders are invested in quality of care and safety as a priority. And by, by, and by leaders, we mean all leaders from the prime minister's office right down to the ward, um, to, to, to the head of, head of a ward. This is a comprehensive uh, uh, investment by leaders in, in, the, in the patient at the center of care. For patients and public involvement, um, we're arguing for uh, a rather bold level of engagement of patients in the processes of design, regulation, and scrutiny of the system, not just activation of patients in the individual care-patient relationship. We're really talking about a quite a revolutionary role for patients, much more centrally in the design and conduct of the system. For the staff's efficiency piece, uh, we are recommending that NICE, the National Institute, uh, be uh, chartered, as I believe it already has been now, to come up with a formula, with an algorithm that could be used by managers of the system to adjust in real time to the needs of staff at the sharp end. Several members of the committee would have preferred that we come out with a particular staffing ratio. As a whole, we backed off about that a bit. What we're saying is, if you run a hospital, you should know what the science is saying about appropriate staffing ratios. You should adapt that to your local context and hold yourself accountable for that. Your board should hold you accountable for that. It should be transparent. But at the moment, we're deferring to NICE to come up with the algorithms that would help you know what would be appropriate locally in terms of response to patient acuity, demographics, and particular stresses. Uh, the training capacity building issue is key, and we are really urging a very serious step forward for the NHS, even more than now, into the mastery of quality and patient safety sciences as part of the preparation and ongoing education of really everyone in, in the service. And we very strongly wish that there would emerge uh, a, 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 an ambitious program of collaborative learning among organizations in the NHS. It has worked in this, in this service in the past. It will work in the future. You know, the press have been picking up a lot of what I'm telling you today, and I kind of wish this was their headline. It's not. Uh, but this is probably the most important, actionable recommendation we're saying. A system of collaborative learning and improvement. It will pay off handsomely for you, as it has uh, in the past. Uh, we've put in the report one model for the improvement skill piece, what it is that people should be equipped to understand and know. This comes from Kaiser Permanente. It's adapted to the NHS. And you can't read this, of course, but in the report, if you want to see more about the skill building piece that we're talking about, it is there. Our position on transparency is unequivocal and, and complete, which is we're arguing for 
a norm in the NHS that all non-personal data on quality and safety, whether that data are assembled by government, by organizations, by professional societies, by anyone, they should be shared in a timely fashion with anyone who wants it, including in an accessible form, the public. It, again, this would be a bold, this would be a world setting leadership act, because I don't know of a system that's committed to transparency at the level that our group uh, is, is urging. And among the, the things to be transparent about is what patients and carers are saying about their care. <coughs> For structures, we have a bit of a tightrope here. Um, I must say in our committee, uh, in our group, we probably, if we had complete, if we just felt we could do anything at all or urge the NHS to do anything at all, we would simplify the regulatory scheme now. It's just too complicated. There are too many players and this possibly even the separation of financial from clinical regulation is not particularly wise as neither is the separation of enforcement from assessment. But there's, right now, you've been through a lot of restructuring, and, and we're kind of saying, well, okay, take a deep breath. You know, you, another restructuring may not be useful right now, but you better keep your eye on this one, because if this doesn't get simpler, it's going to be very hard to have regulation be part of the overall improvement agenda. Indeed, we recommend a review, a prompt review, of the degree to which cooperation is emerging <coughs> among the regulators, which is key. With respect to enforcement, we did introduce one new uh, recommendation for a criminal sanction. We did this, I would say, hesitantly, but we feel it's, it's appropriate that there are occasionally very, very rare instances, and I want to estimate, e emphasize how rare we're talking about, in which there is completely negligent and uh, neglectful, willful, reckless behavior in, in those cases. As in any industry, we believe there should be recourse to sanctions that currently would, we think would require a new statute. Um, Overall, if, if I, my elevator speech about what we're recommending is, is tough, we, we, we produced uh, more recommendations than I had hoped, but there are four basic principles to what you're watching as you see this play out, and I want to make sure you, these are clear, because this is what should be acted on. Number one is put the experience of the patient first. The patient comes first, no matter who you are in the system. Second, hear the patient, hear the car carer, empower the voice of the people we're trying to help. They have more information almost than anyone else in the system. Third, invest in the growth and development of the capabilities of staff, their ability to improve what they do, and their ability to work together to improve what they do, both within and across organizations, and that will require investment. And finally, take a big leap toward transparency that is absolute and complete. Um, if we believe that the potential is enormous, the, the, I think my group emerges from our work with optimism that this the, the, the sky's the limit for the NHS of England. It can, it, can, it, can, it can set the pace, global pace for safety if you choose. After all, what other nation could have had a mid-staffs occur and have the complete mobilization of intent, uh, interest, uh, all sectors involved except one that has a national health service like you do? The, the very fact that we're here today fretting about what happened at mid-staffs is a strength of the system because it means you can respond, you can get together and decide, wait a minute, this is not what we intended, and as a total community, take action. Um, we have, in our report, then taken these recommendations and parsed them out as almost, as requests, I guess would be the way to say it, to different stakeholders, and I want to just walk you through some of these top-line requests. For the leadership, the top leadership, for the, the government, the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State, the, the NHS uh, leadership, uh, you've got to talk the safety and quality talk, and that is not going to go away. That's every day, all the time. I, I, it's relentless uh, and, and never-ending. It will never not be part of your job to assert that the NHS is about quality and the patient experience. And part of your duty is to assure, as Bruce Keogh did in this brilliant report, that when warning signs ring, response happens. Uh, when, as my friend Lucian Liebes says, he says, when something happens, something happens. And that confidence the public has that when there is an alarm, it will go off as it did not go off, it was not responded to at mid-staffs, it will not happen. Um, I, it will require leadership right up to the top to invest in the improvement capabilities of the NHS and use the theory of improvement, Reli understand how much pride and potential joy there is in the workforce if you as a leader can call upon it. And I think we're asking the senior leaders to address the complexity of the regulatory system. At the moment, if there's no taste for restructuring, then absolutely insist on unprecedented levels of cooperation among the players. We're talking here about CQC and Monitor and Trust Development Authority and others. They must cooperate. If they do not cooperate at an unprecedented level, we recommend restructuring. We have specific uh, guidelines in there about uh, about the, the restructuring that could be 
useful. If you run a trust or a, a clinical unit, put patients in the center, listen to them, not just in their individual care, but in terms of design and conduct and leadership of organizational processes at every step in care and every step in governance. Monitor quality and safety constantly. If you don't understand the data, if you're not getting the data, you won't be able to respond to the warning signals or to the day-to-day -day agenda of improvement. Uh, several members of the group brought to our attention and eventually won over the entire group on the particular issue of safety alerts. Uh, this is what um, Liam Donaldson used to call the orange wire problem. If, it, if I'm gonna fly home tonight on a 777, if there's a burned orange wire when it arrives in Boston, at five o'clock by midnight, every, 77, every 777 in, this, in the world will know it. That, that you, you just don't ignore it. That's a safety alert. And, and we, we, I think we now have converged as a group on the importance of really getting the safety alert system right. There should be no, n no compromise in that. We think it will be important for leaders of organizations to embrace complete transparency. You'll have to swallow hard to do it, but it's time to go there. And I, again, I think you can set an international standard. You'll have to be part of the training of staff as we talked about earlier. And we would recommend that every single organization in the NHS be part of at least one multi-organizational collaborative from now on and forever. That, that there's nothing like a network to learn about how to make things better in an area you're currently working on. And then uh, for staffing levels, we have eschewed a particular staffing ratio at the moment. To, to, even though we aren't completely unanimous on that decision, that's where we've come down. But we do think it's your duty to use evidence-based tools to assure adequate staffing levels. And soon, if things go well, you will have the guidance on that from Monitor. For regulators, you've heard my request, our request. Simplify your work, clarify your work, align your requests and demands. If there are going to be three regulators making an inspection at uh, Salford Royal in April, do it together, not separately. Don't drive the leadership crazy by having three separate inspections that are not coordinated. Reduce the waste. Cooperate fully and seamlessly with each other, and that, I must say, is asking for above and beyond the current levels of cooperation. For educators and professional regulators, those who are setting standards for professions, you will need you, you will need them to assure the capacity and involvement of professionals in quality as, as teammates and leaders in continual improvement. And a big challenge to the professional uh, organizations, the Royal Colleges, for example, is to embrace transparency. We believe it, is, it should become the norm for Royal Colleges that when you do audits, when you do studies of what's going on in your profession, turn the lights on and show everybody what you've discovered, that, that it's time to get beyond uh, the other belief system. For staff and clinicians, uh, you have a duty, which is to be participating in the improvement of systems of care. The way Paul Batalden and my colleague says it is, you have always have two jobs. You have your job, and you have the job of improving your job. And that involves skills and commitment, and you, have, you should be able to rely on leaders making it possible for you to do that, but that becomes a duty, which means you have to learn how to do that. So for all of us, that may mean going back to school a bit. If you see something go wrong, say so and expect of your leaders that you can say so. It is not acceptable for a leader to uh, silence a worker who's seeing a safety problem. That's not acceptable. And that's one of the duties we're now putting on leadership, value and embrace openness, especially when speaking up about, when people are speaking about things go wrong. And remember, the patients are in a new position, given the vision in our, in our report, it's that they're power, powerful, they're, they're there, they're with you, uh, invite them and train them to participate as co-producers. And for the patient side, if you're able, if you're willing, this is not a compulsion, it's an invitation, be an active partner in your own care and be an active partner in the design and redesign of the system that's giving you care. And please speak up. Again, not a compulsion, it's an invitation, but you, you, have, you have a right to speak up and you have a right to an expectation that you will be heard.